The brain has two parallel information processing units represented by the two hemispheres. These systems can exchange information with one another, but they otherwise operate in relative isolation in order to handle different types of information without interfering with one another. This makes sense since it is always helpful to have two different perspectives when attempting to deal with a situation so that they can weigh and compare their points of view and come to a consensus. This is why it is helpful to think of the hemispheres as being two distinct people inhabiting a single skull, each with their own particular personality and worldview. We can see the difference between how each hemisphere processes information when we think about what it means to know something. How is it possible to know anything at all? Knowing anything, amazingly, requires these two processing units working in tandem. We use the word know in two senses. For example, do you know what the capital of Portugal is? It's Lisbon. If you didn't know that, now you do. This idea of knowing is essentially knowing facts, which can be called to mind and shared with others. But there is another sense of knowing a place like Lisbon, and that is having a feel for the city, which is only possible if you've been there. This sense of knowing isn't easily transferable, since it is hard to put into words. You can only know a place like Lisbon by actually going there and becoming familiar with the city, and experiencing what it is like directly. You might know of Lisbon from a Wikipedia article, but only the people of Lisbon and any visitors actually know what it is like in all of its complexity and dynamism. But also notice that each of them probably experiences something slightly different, since they all know the city in different ways stemming from their personal experiences. This makes their knowledge of Lisbon unique. These two ways of knowing something represent the way the left and right hemispheres respectively understand the world. One is a shorthand, a kind of code for something, which I can refer to and also transfer to other people, and this type of information is dealt primarily with the left hemisphere. The other is the sense of familiarity we gain from direct experience, something which is more like a unique feeling rather than an explicit thought, and this is the mode of comprehension characteristic of the right hemisphere. In general, we understand people in the same way, as holistic entities whose uniqueness is hard to express. If I just told you a person's hair color, height, gender, where they were from, and described their personality, this would still not give you a good sense of what the person is actually like, because any individual is so complex that we can only really understand them holistically, unconsciously, something we feel with our emotions rather than explicitly think. These types of knowing are so distinct that many languages have distinct words for them. These processing systems can be thought of as an encoder and a decoder. Numerous studies confirm that whenever we encounter something new and unfamiliar, our right hemisphere is engaged, whereas the left hemisphere deals with things that are familiar. Jung wrote that all cognition is akin to recognition. By this he meant that human cognition is attempting to impose something with which we are already familiar upon any new encounter in order to make the new experience familiar. This means that whenever we encounter something new, we try to compare it with an idea we already know, and as such, we gain familiarity with the new experience. This is how we understand anything. We first impose an idea we already know, which transforms whatever it is we are trying to understand into something which feels familiar, but we also see the differences, which distinguishes it from other things. This is why we often contrast two things, such as the brain and a computer, and note the similarities between them in order to understand each of them within a new context. Saying that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell is to use something familiar, a powerhouse, and apply it in a new context so that we gain familiarity with the idea of mitochondria. Understanding any one thing requires comparison with something else, something with both similarities and differences. For example, do you know what a wonderpus photogenicus is? It's a type of octopus. When I said that, you might have automatically imagined something like this, but the wonderpus actually looks a little different from the prototypical octopus. Seeing this image and comparing it with an octopus, you can see what it has in common with the octopus, and also how it differs. This contrast allows it to stand out as something unique, but the similarity also allows your mind to classify it according to a familiar idea. Notice also that the word wonderpus photogenicus now means something to you. In other words, it has been codified, so that the next time I mention the wonderpus, you will know what I am talking about. That's what is incredible about language. It allows for us to codify an infinitely complex world. As we know, the codifying capacity of language is primarily dealt with in the left parietal region and can be thought of as a conscious re-representation we produce of the world in contrast to the unconscious emotion-based cognition characteristic of the right side. This left parietal region is larger on the left side, but weirdly, this expansion seems to predate language 
since it can be found in many primate species who don't have language in our sense. Syntactical language only appears to have developed around 80,000 years ago, when the first evidence of complex symbol manipulation appears. This raises the question of how our pre-lingual hominid ancestors, like Homo erectus and Homo heidelbergensis, were able to operate as social mammals. How did they communicate with one another? What McGillcrest proposes is that, before the development of referential language, communication occurred in a form which was more similar to music, that is, a language of pitch, intonation, prosody, and gesture. This is in fact how many primates communicate today, using their voices to sing rather than speak, and meaning is conveyed through the tone and pitch of the sounds, which we don't need to consciously ponder in order to understand. That is why it is obvious that this sound indicates a chimpanzee in distress. Just as music conveys emotions directly to our unconscious minds, so too did this early form of communication serve as a medium for communicating emotions. Babies begin to sing before they can form words, and they also prefer baby talk from their mothers, where individual words are sung rather than merely spoken. This essentially communicates emotion, and is something we process unconsciously. The fact that wolves howl to one another, and that whales and birds use forms of communication, which are more similar to music than to language, shows that it could be older and more primitive than language. Dogs can understand how their owners are feeling based on their tone, showing that this emotional form of communication likely predates language. Even communication between humans largely depends upon prosody and gesture, rather than just words. The tone of how I say something indicates the emotional significance of it, and so the way we convey information itself codes for hidden meanings. If I say something with a threatening tone, my voice modulates how the message being conveyed is understood, whereas saying the exact same thing in a cheerful tone will be interpreted differently. Our body language, gestures, and posture also conveys information apart from the words we speak, and our facial expressions also indicate the emotional significance of what we say. This non-verbal language explains why text messages are so easy to misinterpret, and why speaking in person allows for a much greater depth of communication. We perceive this non-verbal information unconsciously, and we feel it through our emotions. This is why seeing a picture of a person smiling can actually make us somewhat happier. Smiling is a visual signal to convey happiness which we unconsciously perceive. We can pick up on other people's moods through empathy, which is why it is easy to tell if somebody is depressed, even if they don't say so. It is not just communication which largely proceeds without language, but also thinking itself. Much of our thinking occurs without language, such as when we have a new, profound insight. Such thoughts come to the mind, but they occur in a fairly automatic manner, and do not require language. This is often how scientists find new discoveries, not from deliberate thinking, but from a more automatic process, which occurs largely in the right hemisphere. One famous example of this is August Kekulé, who discovered the shape of the benzene ring when the image of the Ouroboros came to him suddenly. This is in fact how we come up with new ideas at all, which is why the right hemisphere, with its freer and more flexible style of thinking, is more creative. The more we try to deliberately think, the more we use the left hemisphere, which can only refer to past ideas, and so this is why the more automatic thought processes of the right hemisphere are better for thinking outside the box. This doesn't mean that language isn't involved in thinking at all, but rather language is a tool for a particular kind of thinking, one which is more deliberate, fixed, and which allows our minds to hold on to concepts. Naming things allows us to refer back to them, which makes our thinking more explicit. And language also allows us to divide up the world into distinct entities. The fact that language in the brain is housed so closely to the part of the motor cortex which controls hand movements is actually not a coincidence. Like our hands, language allows us to seize and manipulate the world. This is why so many words for using our hands are also synonyms for understanding, such as when we say that we have grasped something, or apprehended it, or comprehended it, which are both derived from the Latin word prehendere, meaning to grasp, and the word tend, from which we derive intend, contend, and pretend, comes from the Latin tendere, which means to reach for with our hands. The word begreifen in German also means to grasp in both senses. As the Hungarian psychologist Geza Revez wrote, if we wish to say we have acquired something mental, we say that we have grasped it. If we don't understand something, we say that we haven't got a hold of it. Just as our hands allow us to seize the world, language allows us to seize ideas in order to hold them and manipulate them. In fact, the word manipulate comes from the Latin manipulus, which means a handful. This is why language is ultimately a means of mapping the world, of distilling it into a code which we can hold in our minds and manipulate freely. 
Language aids in this deliberate form of cognition, when we need to pin ideas down. It is a way of representing a conceptual version of the world, distinct from the actual lived world. Language also allows us to transfer very specific information to other people, especially about things which are not present. And so it allows us to plan things ahead of time, a skill which becomes stronger when language becomes written. It enables reference of thought and allows you to refer back to things with which you are already familiar. And having words for things allows us to remember them much more seamlessly. Along with manipulating the world in our minds, language allows us to manipulate other people and to have other people do very specific things, something which would be impossible without language. Now that we understand generally how the two information processing units work, we can begin to see how they work together in order to produce comprehension. It turns out that both hemispheres deal with language, and their contributions to language processing together make it possible to understand anything. Metaphors are actually what allowed the bridging of these two cognitively distinct worlds. Metaphors, as Julian Jaynes once remarked, aren't merely a feature of language, but the very constitutive ground of language. Metaphorical meaning occurs in two ways. In the first way, a word can automatically bring up associations to other words or ideas which are related to it. If I say the Soviet Union, a number of related ideas may come to mind, such as this, or this, or this, or this, but these remain in the back of your mind, subtly informing how you think about the subject. The second form of metaphorical meaning is the fact that all ideas need to be expressed in terms of other ideas. This is exactly why the idea of grasping something with the hands becomes a metaphor for understanding it. This metaphor produces understanding because of a relatedness between these ideas. There is something similar about them, and so the one, grasping with the hand, is used as a metaphor for the other, grasping with the mind. All abstract ideas are derived from metaphors pertaining to concrete ideas. Even the word concrete has a literal meaning, but is being used to mean tangible or subject to direct encounter, i.e. as a metaphor. A metaphor like saying that a person must be like a stone attempts to relate characteristics of a stone, mainly its heaviness and the fact that it is not easily movable, to describe a person's behavior. The unconscious connotations we associate with the stone are being applied in a different context to help understand this new context in a clearer way. All language is derived from metaphors, and without metaphors, it would be difficult to generate new thoughts or ideas, and so metaphors bridge the conscious and unconscious minds. All of the words we use to mean understanding are themselves metaphors, often for reaching with the hand, including comprehension and apprehension. At the beginning of this video, I said that the two hemispheres handle different types of information, and the reason this makes sense, despite the fact that brains don't have appendages for grasping, is because handling stands as a metaphor for the activity of the two hemispheres. They aren't literally handling information, but what they are doing is similar enough that I can use the word handle without any confusion. Oftentimes, things we experience only in particular situations have metaphorical connections to other aspects of life. For example, such as when we say that life has thrown us a curveball. Being thrown a curveball originally only applied to baseball, but it has similarities to whenever something unexpected occurs, and so we abstract it away from its original context so that it applies, via metaphor, to other situations. The body is very commonly used in metaphorical ways, and in fact, the body may have been the earliest metaphor. This fact may be proof that language originated from metaphors of the body, the body being the first thing with which we are familiar through which we can gain a sense of familiarity with the world out there. This is why we have phrases like the flesh and blood of something, or the body of something, such as a car or an essay, or when we say that music embodies emotion. Remember, however, that the right hemisphere is what is able to understand metaphors, because only it takes into account the context in which the metaphor is being used. Even the body language we use when we communicate is an attempt to use spatial imagery as a metaphor for what we are trying to express. The right hemisphere understands context, as well as the metaphorical connotations associated with the word. It can thereby filter aspects of the world which are irrelevant to the situation, while considering connotations which are appropriate to it. Take the word experiment. We can mean this in the sense of experimenting with new clothes, or experimenting on lab rats. These are two different situations, but the word experiment has a similar meaning in each of them, namely that something is being attempted. But our minds filter out the broader connotations so that we understand the word experiment in a particular way in each scenario. In fact, the word experiment comes from the Latin experiae, which means to try. 
demonstrating how all ideas are derived from other ideas. This demonstrates the role in cognition served by each hemisphere. The left is able to codify ideas so that they are packaged and easy to manipulate, such as when we coded Wonderpuss, while the right hemisphere understands implicitly what the word means by unpacking it, and is able to flexibly apply these meanings in new situations in order to create new meanings in different contexts. And it is also the right hemisphere which understands the entire situation holistically. All metaphors begin with the real world, and then become applied to new situations in order to produce new understandings based on familiarity. The fact that the hemispheres are divided in these tasks is what makes cognition possible at all. Two systems operating slightly differently work together to produce something which is more functional than merely the sum of their parts. However, it is clear that the right hemisphere ultimately plays the more significant role, that of stringing together the bits understood by the left hemisphere, and gluing them together into a cohesive whole while also taking account of the emotional and metaphorical significance of the information. Despite the predominant role of the right hemisphere, many brain researchers have regarded the left as being superior and capable of rationality, one going so far to say that the right hemisphere has a cognitive aptitude inferior to that of a chimpanzee. This is because we have tended to view the conscious mind with its deliberate intent as superior to the unconscious, but remember, whenever we speak, we are speaking with the left hemisphere, and so the left hemisphere may just be biased when talking about itself. However, the left hemisphere may only seem to be more rational because it refers back to what we already know, what we are familiar with, and discounts possibilities we haven't become familiar with. The right hemisphere, with its ability to process new information, is better able to arrive at new ideas, whereas pure rationality may be a hindrance, which doesn't allow us to consider possibilities beyond what we previously know. This obsessive desire for rationality may actually hinder our ability to think flexibly and consider other perspectives, and this may be made worse by our over-reliance on language, which isn't the world itself but rather a virtual world inside of our heads. The problem is that we seem to be living inside this internal virtual world, and acting like it is real, and most people aren't even aware of the separation between language and the world it describes. We can use language to simplify the world, but this simplification comes at the cost of producing a barrier between the simplification and the sheer uniqueness, complexity, and ambiguity of the real world. The expansion of the left hemisphere in humans has been useful for making us rational creatures, but it has come at the expense of our creativity and ability to empathize with others. Empathy and emotion are important for understanding other perspectives and for countering the left hemisphere's tendency to view people as mere tools for manipulation. This is why the right hemisphere perspective needs to be brought back into our lives, as without these capacities, society will become more and more psychopathic.